Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming together for our immersion in our relationships that are deepened by our embrace of this wisdom we call Torah. We are in Parshat Shmini, the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 9, beginning with the very first verse. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute together, we can recite our blessing, giving thanks for this moment. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Yitzhak 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 Thank you, God, for this opportunity to immerse ourselves in words, deeds, and relationships of Torah. We will read through our English translation uh, of our Torah portion. I'll share with you a bit of a focused study of our portion, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation about it. So Book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. He said to Aaron, Take a calf of the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and bring them before Adonai and speak to the Israelites saying, take a he goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, yearlings without blemish for a burnt offering and an ox and a ram for an offering of well-being to sacrifice before Adonai and a meal offering with oil mixed in. For today... Adonai will appear to you. Richard, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse five? Uh, yes, thank you, Rabbi. They brought to the front of the tent of meeting the things that Moses had commanded, and the whole community came forward and stood before the Lord. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded that you do, that the presence of the Lord may appear to you. <clears throat> then Moses said to Aaron, Come forward to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering, making expiation for yourself and for the people, and sacrifice the people's offering and make expiation for them as the Lord has commanded. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Tony, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse 8? Sure. Thank you. Aaron came forward to the altar and slaughtered his calf of sin offering. Aaron's sons brought the blood to him. He dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar, and he poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. The fat, the kidneys, and the protuberance of the liver from the sin offering he turned into smoke on the altar, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And the flesh and the skin were consumed in fire outside the camp. Then he slaughtered the burnt offering. Aaron's sons passed the blood to him, and he dashed it against all sides of the altar. They passed the burnt offering to him in sections, as well as the head, and he turned it into smoke on the altar. He washed the entrails and the legs and turned them into smoke on the altar with the burnt offering. Thank you. Timu, do you want to read a little bit, beginning at verse 15? Next, he brought forward the people's offering. He took the goat to the people's sin offering and slaughtered it and presented it as a sin offering like the previous one. He brought forward the burnt offering and sacrificed it according to regulation. He then brought forward the meal offering and taking a handful of it, he turned it into smoke on the altar in addition to the burnt offering of the morning. He slaughtered the ox and the ram, the people's sacrifice of well-being Aaron's sons passed the blood to him, which he dashed against every side of the altar. And the fat parts of the ox and the ram, the broad meeting, the broad meeting, and eat it there. Did I make me sick? Oh, <laughs> Sorry. The, the covering fat, the kidneys, and the protuberance of livers, they laid these fat parts over the beast, and Aaron turned the fat parts into smoke on the altar and waved the beasts and their right, right thighs as a wave offering before the Lord, as Moses had commanded. Thank you. Okay, and uh, June, would you like to read a little bit, beginning at verse 22? And Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering 
and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came forth fire from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Thank you, Jude. Thank you so much. Let me invite Paul. Would you like to read a little bit at the very start of chapter 10? Thank you, Rabbi. The sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, each took his fire pan. They put fire in them and placed incense upon it. And they brought it before Hashem, an alien fire that he had not commanded them. A fire came forth from before Hashem and consumed them, and they died before Hashem. Moses said to Aaron, of this did Hashem speak, saying, I will be sanctified through those who are nearest me. Thus I will be honored before the entire people. And Aaron was silent. Moses summoned Michael and Elzaphon, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Approach, carry your brothers out of the sanctuary to the outside of the camp. They approached and carried them by their tunics to the outside of the camp, as Moses had spoken. Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Elazar and Ithamar, Do not leave your heads unshorn. And do not rend your garments that you do not die. And he become wrathful with the entire assembly. And your brethren, brethren, the entire house of Israel, shall bewail the conflagration that Hashem ignited. Do not leave the entrance of the tent of the meeting, lest you die. For, for the oil of Hashem's ointment is upon you. And they carried out Moses' bidding. Thank you very much, Paul. And then David and Susan, would you like to continue there from verse 8? Thank you, Rabbi. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Is it, and they did according to the word of Moses? Yes. Uh, verse 8, and, and I spoke to Aaron, saying, drink no wine. Okay. And Adonai spoke to Aaron, saying, Wine and strong drink shall you not you shall not drink. You and your sons with you, when you come into the tent of meeting, lest you die, a perpetual statute for your generations, to divide between the holy and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the Israelites all the statutes that the uh, that God spoke to them by the hand of Moses. And Moses spoke to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his remaining sons. Take the grain offering left from the fire offerings of, the, uh, of God and eat it as flat cakes by the altar, for it is holy of holies. And you shall eat it in a holy place because it, because it is your statutory share and it is your son's statutory share story share from Hashem's offering by fire because that is what I was commanded and you shall eat the breast of the elevation offering and the thigh of the donation in a pure plate of the donation in a pure place you and your sons and your daughters with you because they have been given as your statutory share and your son's statutory share from the peace offering sacrifices of the children of Israel. They shall bring the thigh of the donation and the breast of the elevation offering with the offerings by fire of the fats to elevate an elevation offering in front of Hashem. And it will be yours and your sons and, and your sons with you as an internal law as Hashem commanded. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dave Lab, would you like to read beginning at verse 16? Then Moses inquired about the goat of sin offering, and it had already been burned. He was angry with Eleazar in Athamar, Aaron's remaining sons, and said, Why did you not eat the sin offering in the sacred area? For it is most holy and 
it is what was given to you to remove the guilt of the community to make expiation for them before Adonai. Since the blood was not brought inside the sanctuary, you should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary as I commanded. And Aaron spoke to Moses, see this day they brought their sin offering and their burnt offering before Adonai, and such things have befallen me. Had I eaten the sin offering today, would Adonai have approved? And when Moses heard of this, he approved. Thank you so much, Dave. And, and Jim, would you like to read at the very start of chapter 11? Thank you, Rabbi. Adonai spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, speak to the Israelite people thus. These are the creatures that you may eat from among all the land animals. Any animal that has true hoofs with clefts through the hoofs and the chews and the chews the cud such you may eat. The following, however, of those that either chew the cud or have true hoofs, you shall not eat. The camel, although it chews the cud, it has no true hoofs. It is unclean for you. The demon, although it chews the cud, it has no true hoofs. It is unclean for you. The hare, although it chews the cud, it has no true hoofs. It is unclean for you. And the swine, although it has true hoofs with the hoofs cleft through, it does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You shall not eat of their flesh or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Thank, you, you, may... Thank you, Jim. Let me, let me invite Gary to go ahead uh, and read, if you'd like, uh, beginning with verse uh, 9. These you may eat of all that live in water, anything in water, whether in the seas or in the streams, that has fins and scales, these you may eat. But anything in the seas or in the streams that has no fins and scales, among all the swarming things of the water and among all the living creatures that are in the water, they are an abomination for you. And an abomination for you, they shall remain. You shall not eat of their flesh and you shall abominate their carcasses. Everything in water that has no fins and scales shall be an abomination for you. The following you should abominate among the birds. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, and the black vulture. The kite, falcons, and every variety. All varieties of raven. The ostrich, the nighthawk, the seagull, hawks of every variety. The little owl, the cormorant, and the great owl. The white owl, the pelican, and the bustard the stork, herons of every variety, the hoopoe, and the bat. Thank you, Gary. And, and Robert, would you like to read a little bit, beginning at verse 20? Yes, thank you. All fowls that creep going upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat of every flying creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap with all upon the earth. Even these of them ye may eat, the locust after his kind, and the bald locust after his kind, and the beetle after his kind, and the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying, creeping things, which have four feet, shall be an abomination unto you. And for these ye shall be unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. And whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven footed nor cheweth the cut are unclean unto you. Every one that touches them shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, those are unclean unto you. Whoso touches their carcass shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even, and they are unclean unto you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Jay, would you like to read a little bit beginning at verse 29? Certainly, thank you, Rabbi. 
the following shall be unclean for you from among the things that swarm on the earth. <clears throat> the mole, the mouse, the great lizards of every variety, the gecko, the land crocodile, the lizard, the sand lizard, and the chameleon. Those are for you the unclean things among all the swarming. Among all the swarming things, whoever touches them, when they are dead, shall be unclean until evening. And anything on which one of them falls, when dead, shall be unclean, be it any article of wood or a cloth or a skin or a sack. Any such article that can be put to use shall be dipped in water and it shall remain unclean until evening. And then it shall be clean. And if any of those falls into an earthen vessel, everything inside it shall be unclean. And the vessel itself you shall break. As to any food that may be eaten, it shall become unclean if it came in contact with water. As to any liquid that may be drunk, it shall become unclean if it was inside any vessel. Everything on which the carcass of any of them falls shall be unclean. An oven or stove shall be smashed. They are unclean, unclean they shall remain for you. However, a spring or cistern in which water is collected shall be clean, but whoever touches such a carcass in it shall be unclean. If such a carcass falls upon seed grain that is to be sown, it is unclean, but if water is put on the seed and any part of a carcass falls upon it, it shall be unclean for you. Thank you, Jay. And Justin, would you like to read starting at verse 39? Thank you, Rabbi. If an animal that you normally eat dies, no one touches its carcass shall it no one touches its carcass shall be unclean until evening. And one who eats of its carcass shall immerse his garments, and he shall be unclean until evening. And one who carries its carcass shall immerse his garments, and he shall be unclean until evening. And any creeping creature that creeps on the ground is an abomination. It shall not be. Any creature that goes on its belly and any creature that walks on four legs to any creature that has many legs among all creeping creatures that creep on the ground, you shall not eat for they are an abomination. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping creature that creeps, and you shall not defile yourselves with them, that you should not become unclean through them. For I am the Lord your God, and you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, because I am holy, and you shall not defile yourselves through any creeping creature that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord who has brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, because I am holy. This is the law regarding animals, birds, all living creatures that move in water, and all creatures that creep on the ground, to distinguish between the unclean and the clean, and between the animal that may be eaten and the animal that may not be eaten. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. That's our entire tour portion. Uh, for the week. Uh, I'd like to present <clears throat> share with you a little bit of focus study, and then we'll open it up for our collaborative conversation. If you have a copy of the study sheet, I invite you to take it out now. And I just want to begin by saying, for, for years, when we've come to this Torah portion, uh, I have focused on Nadav and Abihu and, and what they did and what how to understand what the Torah is telling us about that. I've also remarked that it was during the reading of this Torah portion uh, years ago that uh, Allen Ginsberg, the great poet, died. And I've tried to draw some connections between the experience and, and the, the sense uh, of aspiration and compulsion that Nadav and Abihu, I suspect, felt to explore something that was perhaps forbidden to them or to explore something that was available to them, but in a, to explore it in a forbidden way, uh, to connect that to some of Allen Ginsberg's own life and, and his poetry. 
But this year when I was reading and, and studying this week's Torah portion, I had a very different experience and I'd like to, to share that with you. And if you have the study sheet, you'll see that I have at the top a painting uh, by Rene Magritte, who was a surrealist artist. So I'd like to have as our point of entry into the written text of this week's Torah portion, uh, this pa painting and, and say something about Rene Magritte and something about surrealism. The surrealism was a post-World War I art movement. It consisted of painters and writers who were horrified by that war's mass slaughter. And these painters and writers viewed the experience of World War I as the climax of hundreds of years of emphasis on the value of reason and rationality, the movement we call the Enlightenment. For them, that whole trajectory of human history led uh, consequently uh, to the horrors of World War I. And so led by the French poet uh, André Breton, the surrealist movement sought to liberate the mind by subverting rational thought and giving free reign to the unconscious. And of course, they were also building upon work uh, that Sigmund Freud was doing by exploring the, the, the subconscious. And at first, the surrealist painting emphasized biomorphic abstraction. But Rene Magritte, a, a, a Belgian uh, uh, artist, uh, who had worked initially as a graphic artist, introduced by contrast into Surreal's painting, a very different approach, a figurative style. And some of his most compelling works are those which investigate the relationship between text and image, often breaking apart well-worn connections between the two. So the image and the text would convey seemingly conflicting information. And his method was designed to undermine our capacity to take at face value the information presented to us in a very clear and precise verbal uh, and visual way. Language for Magritte, he viewed as an artifice full of traps and uncertainties. His work uh, consists of images painted in a clean and straightforward style. And they invite us to question what we thought we knew. And this subversion of the surface, uh, of the apparent, of the conclusion that was drawn solely by our rational, logical mind is the mission of surrealism in general. To rely only on the rational and the logical is to mistake our desire for comprehension and control with what is actually happening in our world and within ourselves at any given moment. And perhaps more tragically, it sets us up for a crippling cynicism when our world does not comport with the predictive rules and protocols of reason. So I have entitled this week's uh, Torah study sheet, The Art of Subversion, because that indeed is what the Surrealists and Rene Magritte were engaged in. They were seeking to undermine our sense that we knew what we were looking at. Uh, we understood the, the meaning of the symbols before us. And so here we have this painting that is, that is entitled The Treachery of Images. And you can see it's a very clear, both in the visual presentation and in the textual presentation on this painting. We have what seems to be at the top, a large, a clearly designed image of a pipe. And underneath it, written in uh, Magritte's beautiful, clear script, ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe. So there's, there's something quite um, both humorous and subversive about this in many different ways, because from just a logical point of view, well, he's absolutely right, right? This is not a pipe. 
This is a painting of a pipe. But uh, on another level, uh, it's somewhat even more complex because we have an image which our data banks and our minds are telling us is, oh, that's a pipe. But then we have under it these words, which also the data banks in our mind are rendering as this is not a pipe. And so there's a conflict. And so now it, it invites us to go deeper into what we thought we knew and to begin to explore, is there something else going on here? So this is how I'd like us to kind of enter into a little bit of an exploration into this week's Torah portion. And the focus will be on what happens uh, at the very beginning with Nadav and Abihu. But I'm kind of really interested in not so much on what happened to Nadav and Abihu, but something else, which I'll get to in just a moment. So let's just review uh, the portion of our, uh, of our reading that deals with Nadav and Abihu, and that's on number one uh, on our study sheet. Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. Moses and Aaron went inside the tent of meeting. They blessed the people. And the presence of Adonai appeared to all the people. Fire came forth from before Adonai and consumed the burnt offering. And all the people saw and shouted and fell on their faces. Now Aaron's sons, Nadav and Abihu, offered alien fire before Adonai. And fire came forth from Adonai and consumed them. This is shocking because we have been leading up to this. This is a, a climactic moment. This is the inauguration, the, the first use of the, of the Mishkan. We have been reading a total of 13 chapters describing the construction of the Mishkan, all the materials that were to go into the, uh, the building of the Mishkan, uh, how it was built, the garments that the, that the priests were to wear. And then we're leading up to this moment is this period of, uh, a week long of preparation for Aaron and his sons to get ready to lead this service. And then now we are on the eighth day, one, one day past uh, the seven days of creation into a whole new dimension. This is the, the day in which they're now finally going to begin using the Mishkan, which if you recall, the Mishkan was to be, if you will, the instrument that was going to on a regular basis serve as a link between the people of Israel and God. And there is this moment where there is the culmination, the triumph of all that work and all that reading that we've been doing and all the preparation of Aaron and his sons and they offer up a sacrifice. They turn on this machine, if you will, of connecting people with God and it works. There God consumes the offering uh, and there's uh, the presence of God is made known to the people. The people are ecstatic. Uh, they, they shout, they bow down, and they're in awe. Everything is working. They're now connected to God. And within a second, it all turns horribly wrong with Nadav and Abihu doing something that then causes them to be consumed by the same fire that had just consumed this offering that represented a connection between God and the people. There is now this, this terrible disruption, this tragic undoing of all of this preparation and all this work. So my question this year to myself is not so much about, well, what did Nadav and Abihu do that was wrong? Or why did God uh, cause fire to consume Nadav and Abihu? This year, I'm interested in why is this story about Nadav and Abihu placed here at this point in the narrative of the Israelite people on the journey? Why wasn't it, it could have been placed much later perhaps. Perhaps it could have been placed in a totally another book besides the book of Leviticus where they could have had as part of a narrative uh, on this day, uh, an offering was made and and Nadav and Abihu, they intervened and they did this and they were consumed. 
It could have been placed much later, but now, for some reason or other, the story is of Nadav and Abihu is being presented right here at this moment of triumph and connection. I'm curious about why that might be. So we're, we're going to look at some verses and commentaries that I brought to see if we can weave together some kind of, uh, of understanding about why this story is here and what that might present to us. So the prophet Jeremiah, we have this verse that's in number two on the study sheet. Behold, my word is like fire, declares Adonai, and like a hammer that shatters rock. In this verse from Jeremiah, we have an equation that's between fire and hammer. My word's like fire, and it's like a hammer. And in this case, uh, the fire is associated with something, another instrument that's not serving to, to fuse things together, which fire can do. It's associated with another tool that causes fracture. So I'm fascinated about this description of God's word, not just having the capacity to fuse and, and unite and join together, but as something that can break things apart, that can cause dispersion. Let's, let's look a little bit further. Number three is from a, a bit of uh, Midrash, uh, from uh, Avot de Rabbi Natan. If you have a sapling in your hand, and someone should say to you that the Messiah has come. Stay and complete the planting and then go to greet the Messiah. Wow, you, you'd think that if someone came up and said, whoa, 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 the Messiah is here. Finally, the Messiah is here. You'd think that you'd drop everything to, to go run and, and behold this experience because the Messiah is supposed to be the one to answer all of our questions, to, to end our experience of exile, to restore our sense of sovereignty. And yet the wisdom here seems to be, no, just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, planting the tree comes first, take your time, no need to rush, you know, take care of your business. Ah, and then, then you can go check out this thing about the Messiah having arrived. Why not the rush? to see this experience that's supposed to end all of our worries and end all of our questions and to bring us all into unity. Hmm. Well, let's look at number four. And this is a Hasidic story about the Baal Shem Tov. Disciples of the Baal Shem Tov wanted to visit a great scholar. They asked the Baal Shem Tov how to know if he was a, a true tzaddik, a true righteous person. The Baal Shem Tov said, hmm, ask him to advise you what to do to keep unholy thoughts from disturbing you in prayers and studies. And if he gives you advice, then you'll know that he belongs to those who are of no account. So here is uh, the Baal Shem Tov, according to the story, say, you'll know if this person is not really a righteous, wise person, if that person tries to answer all of your questions, especially all of those questions having to do with your own internal disturbance and sense of distraction. The person who seems to have the capacity to know everything, especially to know all those things that have uh, caused us to be distracted from our sense of holiness. If that person gives you advice, that person isn't a true holy person. It reminds me of a, another bit of Midrash where uh, the figure Satan is, uh, is described as uh, the character who has all the answers. To have all the answers is to be a deceiver, in other words. Well, what perhaps the greatest text in, in, Jewish, uh, in the Jewish uh, library that has to do with the notion of confounding our sense of what God is all about is the book of Job. And if you remember the story about the book of Job, this is a seemingly righteous person who's, who's afflicted with terrible, terrible uh, diseases and injuries and death within his family. And he has a, 
uh, but he refuses to give up his devotion to God. And he has these friends who come to him and say, Joe, uh, you know, you're skin, you've lost your family, you've, you're impoverished, you have these diseases on your body. Surely you must have done something wrong uh, to, to have incurred uh, all these horrific events. Because after all, that's the way the calculus of justice works. If you've done something wrong, you get punished. Look, Job, all you need to do is, is to atone for whatever it was that you've done wrong and, and everything will be corrected. That's the way the, the system is supposed to work. And Job says, I haven't done anything wrong. And the friends continue to say, no, you must have done something wrong in, in order to be experiencing all this tragedy. But finally, towards the end of the book of Job, God addresses uh, Job's su supposed friends. Adonai said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I am incensed at you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me. In other words, you think you know the way this is supposed to work. You think you know that if you follow certain protocols, certain outcomes will occur. That there's a clear calculus that you can follow and, every, and things will then become certain. And God says, that's not the way this works. Those who may have uh, participated several months ago in a study of the book As a Driven Leaf that was led by one of our members, uh, Mark Thompson, will recall, we'll call in a sense, that's what that whole book is about. It's about this one character who seems to have been living in accordance with a certain calculus about how to live that will then result in certain outcomes. And is at first disturbed when he sees a, a child uh, going up into a tree to get uh, uh, from to get birds from a nest, and in the, the Torah says, you know, don't don't do that while the mother bird is is in the nest. Wait till the mother bird goes away, then you can get the eggs. And the child follows that prescription, but falls from the tree and dies. And our protagonist. Uh, known as the Acher, says the child did everything the Torah said he was supposed to do, and he died. And that seems to be what triggers his sense of, of cynicism, his questioning of the whole system, and eventually his sense of apostasy. So what all of these um, lessons uh, on the study sheet up to this point seem to be telling us is that we need to prepare to live in a world not of perfection and of calculation where you can be assured of what the outcome will be. We need to be prepared to live in a world of dissonance and imperfection. If you turn over, we have one of our great Psalms a song, if you will, uh, that characterizes uh, this sense of how to live, not with a lack of tension, but how to live with tension. Psalm 89 uh, is, a long, is a long psalm, and it starts off uh, at the very top. I have verses two through three. Let's just read those for a moment. I will sing of Adonai's steadfast love forever. To all generations, I will proclaim your faithfulness with my mouth. I declare your steadfast love is confirmed forever. There in the heavens, you establish your faithfulness. And it goes on for stanza after stanza in which the psalmist is proclaiming the steadfast love, the certainty of God, the faithfulness of God. And then we get towards the end of this psalm and we get these words. Yet you have rejected, spurned, and become enraged at your anointed. You have repudiated the covenant with your servant. You have dragged his dignity in the dust. Oh, Adonai, where is your steadfast love of old? 
which you swore to David in your faithfulness. So here is a psalm in which the core claims of both joyful celebration of faith and of anguished disappointment stand together. And in the psalm, the tension is unresolved. There's, there's no happy ending. There's no conclusion. There's no resolution to the tension. There's no final word that makes it clear, is God faithful or is God abandoning of, of faith with us? To expect only good predictive results is not to live in this world, is what this body of wisdom is telling us. To forsake the desire for control, however, is the beginning of freedom. So I look at why the story of Nadav and Abihu is placed here. Why not somewhere else? Because we have led up, we have been led for weeks now to kind of awaiting this moment of the Mishkan being anointed, to having a system in place that will assure God's presence among us and our connection with God. And the Nadav and Abihu story is there to remind us, it won't always be that way. Life is going to have moments of connection and moments of disconnection. It will have moments of unity and will have moments of fracture. And if you want to be a free people, then you need to learn to live with both. You need to learn to live with the tension of both. And so, ce n'est pas une pipe, this isn't a pipe. If all we're relying upon is the calculus of our rational and logical mind and thinking that two plus two will always add up to four, we won't survive well in this world. We have to be able to rely on something else, something deep within us, something mysterious. And we have to acknowledge that we ourselves are full of conflicting desires and to suppress one of them won't do us any good either. We need to be able to live with all of our urges and to constantly be seeking in the protocols of what we're learning in Leviticus of how to elevate them for the sake of ourselves and the well-being of the world. And with that, I'd love to hear what you may have seen, experienced, or heard uh, within this week's Torah portion. If you raise your hand, I'd love to call upon you. Paul, and then Jay. Well, I, I think that David once commented that I was kind of cynical in a lot of the comments that I made. And uh, I think the comments you just made now could explain a lot of it. And that uh, when I went to the yeshiva, I started in kindergarten and it was 1939. And uh, so the rabbis that I had, had lost most of their families. And uh, so, uh, the discussion about, you know, facing, you know, when it, when it came to business of praising God and all this stuff, uh, I was, I was kind of trained by people that, well, what, uh, show me something else, just type of, you know, really very cynical. And, uh, because that was their world experience. So it was the same as maybe the people there who was witnessing the two sons of Aaron going kaput. These are people who were there and witnessed it. And then they were our teachers, you know, for the next, through the war and after the war. And so uh, I, I really appreciate the uh, discussion that you just offered now and that explains something that, you know, uh, in fact, uh, I appreciate more the, the Midrash attitude than rather than necessarily the text of things. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that and your experience with those teachers and what you've learned. Thank you. And, and, and Jay, did you want to did you want to offer something? Not at this time, Rabbi. Okay, okay my friend. Got some, some other force must have raised my hand. Who okay. was it amongst you that raised my hand? Okay. 
Or let me then call on Gary. Okay, Gary. Thank you, Rabbi. I, I wanted to touch on number four, <clears throat> and I certainly, I do not disagree with the Bam Shem Tov, and far be it from me to offer advice to anyone else, but I, I think it's okay for me to offer advice to myself, and what I get from this and what I continue to learn from Judaism is it talks about the unholy thoughts from disturbing you. And this is an ongoing theme when I talk to some of my friends from, from other faiths and those of no faiths who are fighting the internal, these internal bad thoughts. And, and when we live in a free society and when we live in a world where God has given us free will, that stuff is out there and it's gonna come in. What Judaism has taught me is that accept it, and as long as you don't act on those thoughts, then it's really irrelevant. I, I, I've often shared with people that that I, I know it's cliche. I, I've used this term before, but but I've used this example before. But you can hate your neighbor, but if he's hungry and you give him bread, then God looks at you as a righteous man. And and I really really believe that. I I, I think that that. Our, our thoughts are, it's only, it's only natural to have unholy thoughts at times. And, and um, uh, I think it's a powerful part of Judaism. So I'm not sure if I'm eloquently expressing what I'm trying to say, but um, thank you for letting me try. Yeah. Gary, <laughs> you, you have, Gary you, you, you have expressed uh, very eloquently one of the more compelling aspects of this body of wisdom. Um, and uh, you, you draw upon from me uh, another story from the Baal Shem Tov, who basically would say to people who had distracting, perhaps even unholy, perhaps licentious thoughts while they were in the middle of prayer, uh, the, the Baal Shem Tov would basically say, just don't, don't try to shove them down and, and bury those. Say hello and say, I will have a, we'll meet later. We'll have, you know, we'll meet later. And, and the same notion it, it occurs within what Sigmund Freud was trying to deal with. The notion that we have these feelings and thoughts and urges within us and they come up and oftentimes uh, they are just messages that are somewhat in a contorted form. Uh, they're trying to, there's something within us wants our attention and, and it doesn't often express itself uh, in a holy way. It expresses itself in some kind of twisted, contorted way because you know we, we are imperfect beings living in an imperfect world and sometimes messages themselves appear to us in, in an imperfect form, but they are conveying some kind of message. If we can sit down with them, have a discussion with them and say, what, what is it that you really want? And let's see if we can reach some accommodation for your fulfillment. Okay, so thank you for, for reminding us about that. Justin. Thank you, Rabbi. Um... There's so much to, to get take in here. Uh, one piece, but if looking at the, the treachery of images, um, there is there's a necessary fluidity of being thrown out of any one frame. And so th there's a movement into a fluidity of meaning. It keeps on shifting. And um, what strikes me in Nadab and Abihu is uh, this is a fire. It's not about fluidity at that point. There's a, maybe they're trying to be fluid with the tradition and then the fire comes and that's it. And, 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 and I do remember again, your cheer on, uh, on, uh, on fire next time. I mean, in a sense, this is kind of a, su a suggestion of what, what happens somehow in this. And so I guess I wonder out of that, between the fluidity that we're, tr we're encouraged to experience in terms of interpretation and understanding of meaning, and then those fiery moments that uh, consume. Right, so uh, let, me, let me first ask if there's someone else who would like to say something, respond or, or raise a question. Uh, Richard, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'm reading from Cloud here uh, that uh, the boys, their punishment by its very severity indicates a high spiritual level they had attained. That is why God said to them, quote, I will give you more honor than you gave me. You brought impure fire. I will slay you with pure flame. And I don't know that that doesn't mean that somehow there's a sanctification going on of their intent, which was out of love, irrespective of whatever we think their immaturity or ego things were. And I was thinking about today, and then I saw that this is not a pipe, and I thought of Putin saying, this is not a war. And I went out and worked in the garden, because that's where the saplings are. Uh, amen. And let me just say, Yochanan ben Zakai, my favorite. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yes, you want to say something Yohanan ben Zakai? Well, gee, is this a good time? Okay. okay. Once about 22, 23 years ago, I, I saw a poem about this uh, Torah portion, which I would like to share with you. It's called A Kiss for Aaron's Sons. I want to be as close to you as breath upon a lover's skin, to embrace you in your fullness, to be enveloped in your everlasting love. Is this not what you want too? Was it not you who called upon us to draw close? You beckon us with offers of peace that we might be healed, free of pain, joined with all. Who could resist the allure? Intoxicated by this promise, Aaron's sons wanted more, more than their priestly duties allowed, to lift the veil and kiss you face to face, to give themselves to you completely, without separation. Their pursuit consumed them on an altar of love. Four men entered the garden to hold your hand and join with you in whispered conversation as lovers are wont to do. Were they not precious? Was it not your sweetness they desired? Yet only one returned whole. Who am I? that I should even try where priests and sages are destroyed. But do you not call? Have you not promised? Who can resist the allure? Right. Thank you. Do, do you have any ideas who might have, who the author of the poem might be? Okay, thank you, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Anna. I think um, to to also uh, bring together uh, on the poem that I shared, a point that Richard was making, and what Justin was just referring to, is that in many theological systems, there's a desire to have, uh, if you will, creedal certainty, uh, perhaps even dogmatic insist clarity. Uh, so that the rules will be made clear and that the outcomes will also be made clear because why else would people obey rules unless the outcomes of following those rules were clear? Judaism is far more radical in that sense. And I think it's radical in the sense that it seeks to describe both how we currently live and how else it's possible to live rather than merely trying to force all of us uh, in, into some kind of straitjacket uh, of belief and behavior. It's acknowledging that we have tumbling within us all kinds of possibilities and urges, some of which come up in inappropriate moments, some of which come up in inappropriate forms, uh, but to deny and suppress them uh, only 
uh, increases the danger uh, to ourselves and others. And so here is this beautiful system that has been created, the Mishkan uh, and, and the, the ritual sacrifices. And the story of Nadav and Abihu is here to let us know you can't always count on all of that working. There's the, because there are more subsurface things happening within our lives that we're not aware of that can affect the outcomes. And that's what Sigmund Freud, whatever we may think about his protocols and his practices, that's what he was, he was continuing this line of thought that went back 2000 years to our earliest rabbis who in the Talmud describe there are mountains above the waters and mountains below the waters. And when they're talking about the mountains above the waters, they're talking about our rational, logical selves. And when they're talking about the mountains under the waters, they're talking about our subconscious. And, and these are both mountains are, are part of the vista of our lives. Uh, and Judaism uh, seeks to honor both and to try and develop some kind of practice uh, that helps us uh, to live in a way uh, that honors both in, in a way that's not destructive by either suppressing uh, what's below the waters uh, or by overly depending upon what's above the waters. So uh, that's why the, the story I think is here uh, is to help us understand that uh, we need to read, we think we were reading these words and we think we understand exactly uh, what they mean and that we can then apply them. Uh, but sometimes you climb up into the tree and you follow every, every rule and every regulation and you still are gonna may fall out of the tree and break your leg. So uh, to me, this bit of Torah wisdom is, is reminding us uh, to be gentle with ourselves, uh, to recognize the reality of what it means to be living in an imperfect world and to remind that we ourselves are imperfect, but that it is possible to live in a way that seeks to advance ourselves and to, and to regulate ourselves in a way that will be healthy for ourselves and those around us. So uh, let me invite Robert, yes, please. Uh, you have to unmute Robert, please. Yes. You know, if I kept it muted, I, I couldn't possibly say anything anybody could disagree with or agree with. You know? Well, first of all, I want to thank your wife. Of course, these evenings are always wonderful. Thank you. But I want to thank your wife for sharing your poetry, which I've asked you to share and you have not, but she did. And I want her to, I want to encourage her to keep doing that because it was so lovely to hear that and have the arts introduced that way as well. I, I don't think I misunderstood her because when I saw her put her arm around you, uh, what I wanted to say is, you know, I really appreciate the, um, I wanna say the honesty of this conversation. My understanding of life is that God has given us an opportunity to grow. And that means we have to arise and struggle. And there are certain teachings, no matter what our tradition, that elevate us. And uh, they've been shared tonight. We all know the goodness and so forth. And uh, you, you mentioned practice. And it's so important that we all find a practice that actually works. I'd like to share something that uh, I've been reflecting on. It's, on my own, it's in my own personal compilation. It comes from my own scripture that I belong to. But I think you'll appreciate it because we found, I believe, that suppression never works. It doesn't work. That's my understanding. But this is something I try and do. When a thought of war comes, oppose it by a stronger thought of peace. A thought of hatred must be destroyed by a more powerful thought of love. And I think this is the journey of life. You know, religion is not formulaic by the hand of man. And I think you were addressing this. You know, it's not as simple as what we think it is. But my understanding is, Job set a fine example 
because no matter what, he didn't lose his faith. And okay. the struggle. Yeah. And again, I want to thank your beloved wife. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Let beautiful and, and David and Susan. And then we'll begin to wrap oh, it up. My my muted? No. Okay. So it's such a good reminder that there's many, it, it's not a pipe. And that David used to say and still does sometimes. Well, in my movie, <laughs> and it's just such a lovely way of being able to step back and realize that there's a different way of perceiving. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Because my movie is so different from everybody else's, we can never agree on what happened. Let's just share one another's movies and works of art and poetry and thoughts and expressions. And I, I want to thank everyone. Uh, as Robert described it as an open, honest conversation uh, without any uh, predictive outcome of where it will lead other than that we'll become closer to one another. And what a great outcome that is. <laughs> thank you all so much. God bless you all. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. 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 It was Much wonderful. Love. Thank you. Much love. Shabbat. Good weekend.